Support Narrative's independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative and check out our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe and download. It's been a bit haywire getting on the show, but we're so glad we finally are here with Greg Smith. Hi, Greg. How are you? Hey, Zav. Thank you. Thanks very much for joining us. We're looking forward to tonight's show, and Eric Garland is here, as as often he is. Um, and tonight's show is about Eric Prince, uh, and it's all about the things that Eric Prince represents to many people. So we're going to talk about Eric Prince as a mercenary, uh, and then also as a political gun for hire. And uh, Greg's known him... Well, how long has it been now? Uh, 20 years? 22 years, probably? A little longer even. I think 97, probably. We were all introduced to Eric Prince in 2007, when his Blackwater military contractors based in Iraq opened fire on civilians in Nusur Square. In leaked videos, the Blackwater contractors were depicted as cold-blooded killing machines, targeting civilians randomly in Baghdad streets. The incident spelt the end of America's efforts in Iraq, and it cost Prince his fortune and a career. We strive for perfection. We try to drive towards the highest standards, but uh, the, the fog of war and accidents and the bad guys just have to get lucky once. After several misfires, Prince managed the most unlikely of comebacks in 2016, riding the coattails of Donald J. Trump. He was considered an unpaid advisor to the campaign, but was trusted enough to negotiate a new world order in the Seychelles with the Russians and to pitch Pentagon brass on privatizing the Afghanistan war. Four years later, thanks to a newly released United Nations investigation and declassified intelligence documents, we are discovering the full extent of Prince's activities as a military contractor, mercenary, and political operative. Prince of Proxy is what we've called the show. Greg, how did you first meet Eric? You know, I was an investment banker. Uh, Eric had just gotten out of the SEAL teams. I think it was 97. And we were selling a business that Eric was interested in buying. Um, and my guy that was selling it, he actually ended up being the guy who bought Blackwater, Jason DeYonker, um, calls me up and says, hey, I've met this Navy SEAL. I think you'd like him. His name's Eric Prince. Can you come and meet him? And I did. Um, we got along really well. Uh, I hopped on a his mom's jet, and we flew down to Moyak, North Carolina, and I went and saw Blackwater for the first time. And uh, what was your impression on seeing Blackwater? Like, what did you think that's of of that uh, of the institution that he built? Well, in '97, Blackwater was you know it was three thousand acres down there in the Great Dismal Swamp, but it wasn't much at that point. They had plowed you know half dozen ranges. They were making some targets. They didn't have a lot of business at all, so. You know, I thought this is kind of a real cool thing, uh, you know, so he can still hang out with his Navy SEAL buddies, but it didn't look like much of a business to me. The United Nations has zeroed in on associates of, of Eric Prince as they investigate what was an attempt to overthrow the legitimate government of Libya that was installed by the United Nations. And uh, on behalf of Khalifa Haftar, the warlord who's taken over at least the eastern part of Libya. Tell us a little bit more about why this is such an important investigation that they've launched. You have a, a warlord, Khalifa Haftar, that's being funded by various governments, probably the Egyptians and the Emiratis, mm -hmm. and they've hired in outside mercenaries to take out the legitimate government backed by the UN, by the West, by the United States. And uh, the claim right now is that those mercenaries are Western mercenaries, Australians, Americans and British. So, I mean, basically, I think as Robert Young Pelton said in the documentary on Four Corners, um, if they're going to do this, who's next? The United States, other than Donald Trump, really do not support Khalifa Haftar. There was a moment there where Donald Trump did support him. Uh, and I don't know if that represents American policy. It certainly didn't change American policy. But overall, the, the United States has been formally in favor of the United Nations government there ever since Gaddafi was killed. And so it's unusual to have Americans, or anybody really from the West, fighting on behalf of Khalifa Haftar. It's beyond unusual. It is insanity. Yeah. When have you ever had the, the formal policy of the U.S. government 
being to back the, the, the government. And then you uh, the president's associates trying to unseat that government. It's it's madness. It is a madness. It's totally confusing and it sets up a, a nightmare scenario. So there was a great documentary on Australian television called Four Quarters. And here's Robert Young Pelton, who's a really good friend of ours on narrative. He wasn't able to be here today, but we have him on tape just explaining the first part of how the operation took place. This operation required buying used gunships, little birds in Amman, Jordan. He was also shipping into Libya uh, three Puma troop carriers and three Gazelle light helicopters, which can be modified to be gunships. The Australian in Amman was a former Air Force fighter pilot called Christian Durant. He was the chief executive of a consulting firm headquartered in the United Arab Emirates called Lancaster Six. Just, we paused it at, at Christian Durant, uh, Greg, because we wanted to hear a little bit more about how you know Durant and what the relationship is between Durant and Eric Prince. You know, we formed Frontier Services Group in November of 2013. And I think it was in November, December, Eric says, hey, Greg, come over to my villa, which I said, fine. I was in Abu Dhabi, and I want you to meet this guy, Serge Durant, Christian Durant. Uh, and I think he ought to be our director of aviation for uh, Frontier Services Group. So we, we go out on the Blackwater sailboat. We go on a day sail, and I meet Serge Durant. Seems like an incredibly well-qualified guy, former um, top gun in the uh, Royal Australian Air Force. At that point, he's working for um, Emirates Airline, extremely well-qualified. And I said, hey, seems like the right guy. Let's absolutely hire him. And it turns out that he went into business with Eric Prince? We terminated Serge's employment in 2015, September, from Frontier Services Group, because he was doing some things we weren't happy about, um, just in terms of moving aircraft around. Mm -hmm. And uh, within days of us terminating his employment, we started sending documents to him, you know, normal separation stuff from a public company. And the address he gave us to uh, send those was at um, Eric's villa in Abu Dhabi, the same one that we took the boat on. I'm like, holy shit, he's living in Abu Dhabi. And at the same time, up on the web, pops up this company called Lancaster Six, basically advertising itself as the same thing as our specialty aviation division at Frontier Services Group used to be. Uh Starting a competitor, basically. Well, not even a competitor because we didn't even want to do that stuff because right. it was all military. It was mercenary bullshit. And, you know, so at that point, everyone in our organization said, oh, Eric and Prince, Eric and Serge have formed this company called Lancaster Six, mm-hmm. and they're going to start marketing themselves. So as I watch over the last four years and I see Lancaster sticks in Afghanistan proposals and Libya proposals. And, you know, people bring me stuff and I'm like, yeah, that's Eric and Serge again, that's Eric and Serge. You know, when I watched that documentary and it was Lancaster six, I'm like, well, of course it was Lancaster six. Of course it was Serge. So that's what I know about Serge and we can keep talking. Yeah, I definitely want to talk some more about that relationship that he he has, because it seems like Eric Prince sort of comes up with ideas, and then uh, he hires Lancaster Six to execute those ideas, um, which, you know, seems like it could be a source of conflict of interest, but, you know, we can't judge that at this point. It's not a conflict of interest at all, Mm. because that's what he was going to do all the time. So, I mean, so Eric's got multiple businesses. One of them right now, he's the vice chairman of Frontier Services Group, a Hong Kong based company partnering with the Chinese. So that's one of his businesses. Mm-hmm. He's got a private equity firm that invests in natural resources, owns a bunch of companies. That's a second business. But the third business, which is his passion, which is what we all saw for 10 years that I worked with him very, very closely, is presenting himself as a mercenary around the world. Mm-hmm. So he's got three businesses. He kind of chooses which of those businesses he's going to use <clears throat> to front an operation in which he's going to use to execute an operation. Right. There's no conflict. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the, what do you have here then? In this case, Mr. Durant bought or leased some, air, some aircraft on behalf of Mr. Khalifa Haftar. Um, this is unrelated to Eric Prince as far as we know, right? I mean, this is just Mr. Durant is doing his thing. Uh, 
as part of a mercenary gig for the general here. And they get there and something goes wrong. It's happened many times over the period of time I've worked with Eric is he promises X and he delivers something like 0.3 X. Mm -hmm. And in this case, when you promise a warlord a bunch of uh, attack helicopters, you ought to show up with them. Right. And they didn't show up with attack helicopters. Uh, they to roll with them. And they went to meet with the general and the general not seeing all his fancy gunships that he paid for, was furious at these men. There was three of them in the room with the general. And at that time, the general said, I paid $80 million, where's my stuff? And there were threats made against Durant's life. Now, obviously, there's a lot of emotion and yelling and whatever. So these men were escorted by an armed guard to a, a complex that had two homes, two houses, and it was very ramshackle, it wasn't uh, well set up. And they had very little time to decide what to do. They landed up getting the hell out of Dodge, as it were. They, uh, they got onto two boats, only one of them worked, and they escaped to Malta, where they were arrested and, uh, and had to explain what they were doing there with all that weaponry and, and equipment. And so they left behind, as well, a lot of information around, um, around who they were, back there because everyone knew that they were trying to do that. They also left a boat behind and other, and other tracks that they were who they were. So now the Libyan government in the United Nations is aware that there was an operation to try and unseat them uh, involving all these mercenaries. And then they launch an investigation. And so recently we, they come up to the, the investigation findings and they did find that Serge um, was involved in at least importing illegally um, arms to the country. Um, but that's where it stopped. It hasn't quite gone to Eric Prince yet. Was Eric Prince involved in this thing? I, th I think I put out on Twitter a little bit a while ago. I'm full of piss and vinegar. So I, I don't want to hold back. Vinegar, but okay. <laughs> Go for yeah. it. Yeah, so I don't want to hold back on much in terms of what we're talking about here. So two things ought to be perfectly clear. First, Lancaster 6, indisputably, those were the Lancaster Six contractors on those red boats that came back out of Libya into Malta. Okay, so there are 20 of them. So that's indisputable. The second thing is Serge Durant claims they were there to do oil and gas work, whatever that means. Right. No one's named a client that they were doing that for yet. No one's named anything. But let me make this clear, and I've made this point clear to the FBI, and I've made this clear to other investigators. What Eric does, his primary cover story, for anything he does mercenary work is we're doing oil and gas security. Mm -hmm. We're doing oil and gas overwatch. That's always the story. Shit, I have provided documents from Eric's attorneys that say, Eric, if you're going to be doing this type of stuff, you can't be doing X, but you can always be doing oil and gas security. Mm -hmm. Okay? So no matter what he's doing, and this was almost certainly, in my opinion, the contract work that was described in Four Corners in terms of they're going to take out high value targets and they're going to act as pure uh, uh, kinetic mercenaries. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the one thing. So Lancaster Six, and they were there operating as mercenaries. Now let's talk about Eric Prince. As I said earlier, it's not plausible that Eric Prince doesn't control Lancaster Six. He's going to claim he doesn't. His attorney's Vince Gordon. And the UAE is going to claim he doesn't. His attorneys here in the U.S. will claim he has nothing to do with it. But what Eric does is pretty simple. He takes a company. And you have to ask three questions. The first question is, Eric, do you own that business? And he'll say, no, I don't own it. Okay, so you don't own the equity of it. Eric, do you have any financial interest in that company? I.e., do you own all the debt? Do they owe you a bunch of money? So even though you don't own the equity, do you control it? And he'll say, no, I don't, own, I don't have that either. Okay, so then the third question that a smart investigator needs to ask is, have you gained any type of benefit from that business? Are you, are you a beneficiary <laughs> owner in any way? <laughs> no, have you gained any benefit, right? So here's the way you would get paid if that's happening, right? So it's an $80 million contract. $80 million goes into Lancaster Six bank account. Lancaster Six isn't going to wire Eric any money, but what happened probably is Eric probably got wired X amount of money from the same thing. So look for wire transfers coming out of whatever entity wired to Lancaster Six going into an Eric Prince or an Eric Prince-related account. 
that's the way he would do it. Anytime I hear about something that's really complex in terms of finance as a for-profit business, I ask a lot of questions. So you're talking about there's two different corporations that are operating out of the same villa in Abu Dhabi, and one might get a contract. And if you went to the guy who owns the villa and is pretty obviously related to the whole thing, he, and he says, "There, oh, I'm not an owner of any of that, but then there's a wire transfer structure elsewhere uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, some other structures that, uh, you know, aren't the, the simplest to explain. Um, anything else you've seen on that, uh, in that regard about complexity? So it's just not the Eric Prince world, but I'll give you an example of complexity, right? So in 2014, we signed a contract in South Sudan, we being Frontier Services Group, to provide oil and gas security work, again, same thing, but there was some other bullshit going on in that contract even. But that's what the contract said. We could not get money paid from the South Sudanese government or the Ministry of Oil, I guess, um, into Frontier Services Group because there were sanctions against them. There was all kinds of stuff yeah. going on. Get it. So we ultimately had to wire money through, I don't know, the Bank of Qatar. Um, so anything that Eric is involved with, and you're dealing with sanctioned countries, Libya, South Sudan, sanctioned governments, sanctioned government personnel. It's always going to be complicated. You have to move money through different paths. As a matter of fact, you don't want to come through the U.S. financial system. If you use the U.S. financial system, which they did to us at uh, Frontier Services Group, they shut it down. They send the wire back. So th there's, there's the web of complexity that is required mm. to do this to have really smart advisors and you need to have bank accounts all over the world. Because some some offshore banking is, you know, and, and I've worked in this space where there's pretty legitimate sounding, at least, um, reasons to be using that those banking structures where you, let's say you have a company that um, intellectual property is owned in Germany. Uh, the management is, you know, bought the company out of Britain, manufacturing is in India, and they have operations on three continents. To whom do you pay tax? You know, right. and so you might structure things in a way that's advantageous. And I don't even find that, uh, you know, even with all the questions about offshore banking, I go, well, that's a good question. You know, what kind of, to whose society should you contribute the most? That should be a negotiation between governments and, oh, okay, that, that seems reasonable. And then there's tax evasion and, you know, sanctions evasion for national security issues. And that's kind of the, when you say we were trying to get around, you know, South Sudanese government sanctions there. So we just went through Qatar instead. That sounds like sanctions evasion. And we've been, you know, the Department of Justice has just hit some, some North Korean sanctions uh, evasion like Friday with some pretty big indictments. So it seems like a big deal. So that sounds complicated for Mr. Prince there. You know, it's, it's always complicated when you're working with Eric because hmm. – with, even if you're trying to run a legitimate business, his passion is not running a trucking company, run a medical evac business. His passion, mm -hmm. as Robert described on uh, Four Corners, is this army in the box, con box concept. So it gets extremely complicated. Like I said, you need really smart people around you and you need helps of government. I mean, Eric could not do what he's doing without help from the Emirati government. Lancaster Six would not exist as a corporation without the Emirati government. Mm. You have to have Adawasta to make that happen. You can't set up a, a company like Lancaster Six and do business in the Emiratis if you're Serge Durant. You just can't. It's not going to happen. He doesn't have nearly yeah. enough Wasta. No. Well, also, something else in terms of, you know, the backing you need. If you're talking about the skill set of being a rifleman, for example, you're a Marine, right? Yes, sir. I'm um, a rifleman. Right? Yeah. And, and, you know, I just saw, I just saw a grotesque mistake in the Washington post with regards to, to you and said, former Marine, I was told there are no former Marines. There may be retired ones, right? Um, the Marines are produced by the U S government. That is a, that is a skill set is that is part of the, you know, the U S armed services. That is a, you know, a grand tradition that comes down through that. And also the, you know, the, the, the skill sets that are trained in, the equipment that you learn how to use, those are financed by the U.S. taxpayer. 
And, you know, Royal Air Force in the UK, same thing, you know, Palachutiste in France, etc. Um, so there's, there's a nation state behind, you know, getting really great soldiers. For example, you know, I think I could hold my own in a reasonably calm bar fight, but I'm not sure about a firefight if you drop me into Nigeria. You know, I'm not a soldier. I was never trained in that. So the people who can handle themselves parachuting in someplace dangerous and painting the town lead, you know, those are special folks, right? Um, that was all financed by, you know, nation states. And in this case, Western nation states, or if we're going to just talk about this country, the United States. And so we're taking those skill sets. And then I understand, you know, because we do this in pharmaceuticals and, and medical technology, we'll do basic scientific research at NIH, for example, or government funded universities. And then somebody applies elbow grease and private, or, you know, some uh, private capital and uh, genius and sweat equity. This is kind of the capitalist model, right? And they go, and I'm going to take this basic thing, I'm going to do put my genius on it, I'm going to sell it, and I get to profit from that. Um, right. And the U.S. government may not ask for money for that. But here, these, you know, you're looking at people that may have been battle tested and may have been, you know, part of an integral part of the United States armed forces. And then they are going off with that skill set. And the capital is coming from all over the place. You know, it sounds like Eric Prince is, is not just you know, just getting a bunch of guys to do a thing in another country. He's, he's taking part of, you know, United States best practices in terms of arms forces and selling them to the highest bidder. That seems like it's got some, some complexities there, maybe even legally. Well, yeah. Well, it, it has complexities uh, because you cannot provide a defense service mm -hmm. if you're a citizen mm -hmm. to anyone outside of the U S without mm -hmm. a license. So maybe Eric right. has a license. Maybe the Department of State, maybe Pompeo issued Eric a license and everything he's doing is perfectly legal. Then someone mm -hmm. needs to ask, does Eric Prince have a license to provide debt defense services to Khalifa Haftar in the UAE? So if he does, everything he's doing is perfectly legal. Right. Doesn't mean it's but right. I don't, I don't think the notion of private security is necessarily a, you know, a, a dodgy thing because they're, let's say you're going to have a, a, a capitalist operation in a country that has a nation state that you'd like to enhance, you know, economic development. You'd like to grow some GDP, right? And, but it's a little dangerous and things might get stolen from. You might need people that can, that can help repel danger and let, you know, let's just, just call them random thieves from coming in and attacking, you know, it is, you know, economic development in a, in a dangerous place. It's sort of a chicken and egg thing. If you haven't got anything there economically, it's hard to make a tax base that'll provide for police service and, you know, nation, you know, national armed forces and whatnot. And so it's a dangerous place. So which goes first? So I can see coming in and not having it be an occupying nation state army because that's very complicated. That's diplomatically in the United Nations. Like, wait a minute, if we had American troops somewhere, it'd be one thing. So I get the idea of having private force. But, you know, it seems like something's, you know, just like you have people that are private investigators or private security in the United States who are not their own militia serving some other taskmaster on, on U.S. soil when they perform those services it seems like what Eric Prince is doing is not just applying best practices of operational security and, you know, combat, you know, if it is required. Um, it seems like there's something, you know, something. But, but, but Eric, let, let's stick specifically with Libya. So here's the okay. something. And this is what you're getting at. If you were going to apply all those things and you're going to help build a nation, you're going to help secure it and stabilize it so they can build the economy. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you be working for the GNA? You would, of course, be working for the GNA and not the LNA. You wouldn't be working to overthrow the legitimately recognized government. You'd be working to stabilize the legitimately recognized government. <laughs> Those so are insecurity in forces, is what you're saying. <laughs> so in this case, what you have is you have Khalifa Haftar, a U.S. citizen, who should be under arrest right now. Wait, um, he's a, Haftar is a U.S. citizen? He is a U.S. citizen. Um, huh. he's been Did some not time. know that. So, he's a U.S. citizen, and yet he's a warlord in Libya. What the hell? 
Khalifa Haftar, U.S. citizen apparently, now warlord, uh, and I don't know what the NI, uh, N N A I C S Labor Department code is for warlord, but I'm going to look it up on Google. Yeah. This. It's more like four of them, so. <laughs> it's like eight six one two five three. And you started talking a little bit about, um, you know, the interest in Libya, and of course, one of the biggest interests in Libya is the oil. That's what they really are mostly after, it seems. Um, these Western governments, and it seems to me that Russia is not only supportive of of uh, Haftar, they're also supportive of of ISIS because ISIS controls a lot of the oil there, and they are, you know, intent on continuing to produce. And, and, and reap the benefits of the oil that uh, Libya has, which is a huge amount of oil. That presents enormous challenges, I guess, for someone like Eric Prince or, or someone like Durant, because they basically are, are, are in league with an adversary. I mean, they're not just uh, maybe our, the biggest adversary that's been attacking our country. And so this, did this ever in your time with Eric come into play? Did it ever come into your mind that oh, you know, we're, we're actually committing what could be considered treasonous acts. No, I mean, I, so I left Eric in uh, 2016. Mm. And at that point, you know, uh, we had been doing work in South Sudan, which was in the support of a civil care recognized government in South Sudan. I'm not sure all the work we're doing is legitimate, but the work we, you know, we work at least with civil care. We'd made present uh, proposals to work with the MOD in Mali, but that was the government. We made, he, Eric had made proposals to work with um, the MOT in Azerbaijan. Um, uh, he had made proposals in Somalia, but like, these were also legitimate governments at that point. Right. It, it, it's it's now the difference between Libya and everything else I saw Eric do. I wasn't comfortable with that, or you know, the reason I resigned. But um, we can talk about China later. But the re the difference here is you're not working for the legitimately recognized governments. You don't ha do you have a license? We know that was Lancaster 6. We know Sir Durant owns Lancaster 6. There's still people who doubt that Eric controls Lancaster 6. I do not. So I just put the two things together and say Eric and Lancaster 6. However, there's still some dispute about that. But, but, but here you're working for someone trying to overthrow a government. Support Narrative's independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative and check out our podcast wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to subscribe and download.